A very warm welcome to day two of Typo Day 2021. Today, we start with keynote address five being chaired by Dr. Ajanta Sen. Co-chair of this conference, Dr. Ajanta Sen, a PhD in development planning from the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, Mumbai, India, has been engaged with play and learn activities in at least three major international projects for over 25 years. First, as a director, Solar Project, a pioneering networking technology project since 1997 and ongoing that created cross-cultural collaborative learning environments for children as a joint UK-India initiative between children's schools and design institutes in India and UK. Secondly, as a co-founder of a startup initiative called Jello Communicator, where she has been involved in conceptualizing and development of an AAC application that helps those with speech difficulty. The third major play and learn initiative for Dr. Sen has been the Cosmic Labs set up at Singapore's NTU and NUS as a joint initiative with IITB and empowering communities through social media innovations. Dr. Ajanta Sen is also a founder, Design in India, India's comprehensive resource site for design. We now request all participants to ask questions through the chat sessions. Thanks and over to Dr. Sen. Thank you, Shweta. Thank you for the introduction. I have the proud privilege to introduce to you our first speaker of the day, who's also our second keynote, Dr. Vicky Kuzens a prominent indigenous artist and researcher, is the vice chancellor's research fellow at the RMIT University, Melbourne, Australia, and engaged with hitting models, pathways, and resources for continuing the reinvigoration of the Aboriginal's ways of knowing, being, and doing, which is another way of saying, working to reactivate knowledge and its action on the ground. The Aboriginals are the counterpart of the Adivasis from Aboriginal people. However, the history of our Adivasis and their relationship with mainstream India is somewhat different from that of the Aboriginals in Australia, where their history of marginalization has compelled scholars and activists like Vicky Cousins, who is herself from this community, to work with others from her community to revitalize her people's languages and respond to the deep Aboriginal desire for reconnection to cultural knowledge and practice. A whole lot of it has been lost and they're trying to regain it. With 250 to 300 identified languages and more than 700 dialects in Australia, with 50 known languages and dialects in Victoria alone, that cannot be an easy task and 40 years of work already points to as testimony of Vicky Kuzan's work in community affairs points to testimony to that endeavor. As member of the Gundit Mara community, Dr. Kuzan's uh, acknowledges the debt to her ancestors and elders who continue to guide her work. Her contributions in the reclamation, regeneration and revitalization of cultural knowledge and practice extend across the arts and creative cultural expression spectrum, including language revitalization, ceremony, community arts, public art, visual and performing arts, and writing. She's also a senior knowledge custodian for Possum Skin Cloak Story and Language Reclamation and Revival in her Kire Wurong mother tongue. Uh, interestingly, header in the email uh, says, I acknowledge the people of the Woi, Wurrung, and Boon Wurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin nations whose unceded lands we conduct the business on for RMIT. I humbly acknowledge their ancestors and elders, past and present. It simply means that your land has been taken away without your permission, and I continue to acknowledge that debt. It is my proud privilege once again today to welcome Dr. Vicky Cousins to address her presentation on the second day of Typography 21. Welcome, Dr. Cousins. Thank you um, very much for that kind introduction. 
and um, with the difficulties of technology that we all experience. Um, I hope that everyone can hear and see me. Yes? Thumbs ups or someone can let me know if it's not working. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the invitation from the Indian Institute of Technology in Mumbai uh, to celebrate Typography Day, um, the 14th celebration with the theme of hope. Um, so I hope that um, that I can leave a hopeful message um, from my from my presentation. It's really an honour to be here sharing um, our story. It's a collective story. It's a continuing story from Aboriginal Australia and particularly from my language group, the Kire Warong from the Gunditjmara peoples in southwest Victoria, which I'll um, in a little while show you kind of where that is on the map and, and orient you um, a little bit visually. It is in our country a requirement for us to be invited uh, somewhere onto country to meet and greet with other people. So, um, and it is an honour then to be able to speak and be given that permission to speak. Ngā tōk Mangaluru Watanu, I come from. And when we speak of uh, where we come from, we of course talk about our family, our ancestors and our country and our place of belonging there. So this is uh, my family from um, on my father's side. You'll see my mother on the bottom right there who is uh, mainly of Scottish ancestry. So I have a bit of a um, liking for men in kilts and bagpipes occasionally. Um, I'm very interested in that side. However, this is my Gunditjmara family, my ancestors, and in, in um, Australian sign language, we do a sign like this over our shoulders to acknowledge our ancestors, <clears throat> all those who've come before us, and our descendants are down from us. So um, I've got five daughters who are on the left there and my husband with the guitar, the singer, songwriter, filmmaker, um, very creative person in his own right and um, the head, co-head of the family with myself <laughs> at this point in time. Um, our five daughters and we've just uh, had six, our 16th grandchild, so we have 11 grandsons and now five granddaughters. So we're very um, excited to welcome little Ivy Joy into the world. It's our um, tradition and practice to introduce ourselves in this way and say who we are and where we come from because Aboriginal culture is uh, very much founded in connection, relationship, belonging and respect. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a little while. This is parts of my country. So we have uh, freshwater places. You can see the waterfall on the left there, Tangan Punot, is where the eels bite the stones, which is talking about when the eels are swimming back upstream, back to their home waters. We have uh, Ma volcanoes and um, lakes and river systems through volcanic plains and beautiful beaches as well. Although it's pretty cold country, so I'll be talking more about how we keep warm in, in our country. Also in identifying ourselves, we talk about our moieties and our totems and these are part of our kinship system. So on my grandmother's side, my father's mother, we're black cockatoo and on my grandfather's side, we're the sulphur crested white cockatoo. And um, that's the two social groups in our culture and that um, you can intermarry in between those groups. Uh, another really important part of our culture or a foundational thing is to acknowledge and respect our ancestors, old people and elders. And uh, Pang Nuti Wing, Nuti Wing Wanong means we remember. And these are two, um, fortunately, we've got photos of two um, ancestors from our tribe who have been inspirational to me in the work that I do alongside um, although my father's passed now, but my father and other elders um, in, you know, in my lifetime. Remembering our ancestors, remembering our stories, remembering who we are and remembering what we already know. 
remembering our responsibility, remembering our vow, remembering our caring, remembering our being. Now, then, and then. Ageless, age-old, synergistic resonance of one. This is talking about the creation time. Some people know it as the dreaming. Or in English, it's uh, probably the easiest translation. It, it speaks of creation, which is the continuous concurrency of past, present, and future. To put it very succinctly, because <laughs> there's a lot, um, a lot to talk about and a long time to talk about. Aboriginal culture, we um, say that we have been here for time immemorial, and um, we that creation um, continues. So we have song lines or story lines, which you might hear me talk about, and our continuing story. So everything that carries forward becomes part of that story and that song line. I, the kind invitation said I could talk about um, anything that I wanted to really. <laughs> so I've kind of set up a, a not not really sure about how much people are aware. At, you know, we all have some awareness in, in these global days of each other's countries and peoples um, somewhat. But um, I'm not really sure how much people are aware of the history of Australia. So I'm going to be talking about a little bit about that, including some of the hard stories that Australia is currently trying to address about its shared history and the um, impacts of colonisation. And then I'm going to talk about my practice and who I am and what I do, and in particular in relation to um, language revitalisation and our Gunditjmara language story. In the introduction, um, you would have heard uh, I'm the Vice-Chancellor's Indigenous Research Fellow at RMIT. I'm also the co-chair of the Victorian Aboriginal Corporation for Languages and have been on the board there at, um, for over 15 years and following in my father's footsteps who began our language revitalisation. And I'd like to acknowledge um, our CEO, Rosales Martinez, who's um, fortunately been able to join us for this session. Uh, so uh, a hello to Rosales out there representing. So I'm going to talk about some not so good things and some um, unpleasant subjects. And there are pictures, if there's any other Aboriginal people from Australia watching, there are, there are images of deceased people in this presentation. Uh, because we have uh, in cultural practices in some communities avoidance of images and speaking people's names who have passed. So I just, we, we always try to um, put that warning or um, let people know before we proceed with our presentations. So um, a couple of old maps and pictures I've borrowed off the internet. Thank you to the internet. Um, and just talking about in our history, whilst the um, 1770 when Captain Cook arrived, we but we also know that there was a long history of contact and exchange and trade between countries in um, Southeast Asia, Asia and the Pacific, including um, we believe Chinese uh, junks have been travelling down around this way, um, people from India, the Portuguese, French and Dutch of all, you know, travelled around our shores well before the English arrived and before the English arrived permanently. Down home in Gunditjmara country, we have a, um, an oral history story and a lot of non-Aboriginal people still trying to find the um, shipwrecked Portuguese. It was shipwrecked on our shores and um, my great-great-grandmother actually is said, to be, is said to have had Portuguese um, ancestry. So um, we don't have any... Haven't done the DNA, but that could be interesting if we did. We also had very, uh, up the top end in um, what we call the top end in the Northern Territory and those states, regular um, interactions with the Macassan people who came for trade and to harvest the sea slugs. Of course, the Torres Strait, who are p officially part of Australia now, up off the top end of the pointy bit, Cape York um, near... Uh, you know, pointing towards New Guinea. And so we've also had uh, lots of connections with New Guinea and Aotearoa, New Zealand, well before the English intruded. And prior to the English coming here and not, not leaving, 
um, we had once people had discovered there was lots of whales in the Southern Ocean. We had lots of whalers and sealers who stole Aboriginal women to work for them while they were doing their whaling. Um, there was a lot of disease, particularly smallpox and, of course, venereal disease from those encounters, which started to impact our, our people. And then the arrival of Cook and the declaration of terra, terra nullius, meaning empty land, set in motion um, the continuing colonial legacy and experience that we live, live with today. And that's been a long journey of resistance. Uh, we still are resisting. We are still working towards the recognition and the understanding and acknowledgement that this is Aboriginal land. And we're making some headway, but it's a very slow process because um, we have in our cultures, uh, broadly speaking, and not speaking for everyone, but a practice of listening that is often um, characterised as deep listening. And um, we we have a problem that, that we believe the Europeans have not been very good at listening. We had many battles and a lot of massacres were perpetrated on our people and in some areas of our life we, we are feeling as if the genocide is continuing and language has been a very big um, part of that. Uh, it's one of the first things that people were forbidden and punished if they were caught um, speaking language and do, doing ceremony. So following the um, battles and massacre period, there, be, there came a period of what we term the protection period and um, the Europeans made uh, mission states and reserves where, quote, you can see on the screen, Smooth the Dying Pillow was coined in one of their documents because they thought that we would all basically uh, die out and be bred out because, as you can tell from looking at me, I certainly don't look like some of my ancestors. However, we're still standing strong in, in who we are and um, holding to our, our place and our sovereignty. Also, to continue that, there's been the White Australia policy in the um, early 1900s and still we still believe that some of that thinking underpins a lot of the, the systems that we're um, still living under. And these images you can see of people in chains and um, the one on the bottom right and women being herded up after a, a battle or a massacre. This is a map of the massacres that have been recorded just in Victoria and over in this area here is um, in the west and this part here is my country or our good Tomorrow country and there's been a high rate of um, massacres and battles. We fought a 20-year battle called the Umarella Wars and a uh, uh, wonderful um, Rosales knows uh, Deborah Cheatham AM or OAM I think she is. Professor Deborah Cheatham from the Yorta Yorta wrote a war requiem for peace about the Umarella Wars which I was fortunate to translate into Gunditjmara. And this map here is a work by Judy Watson, a Queensland Aboriginal artist, just starting to document some of the known and recorded but she's also working on the oral history because we have oral history in families of battles and massacres that have occurred that aren't recorded or recognized and the other other thing that people struggle to address in Australia is the slave trade that was perpetrated here with Aboriginal people being forced to work for no wages and or what were called rations where they were given some some meat and flour, sugar and tea. Uh, so because we didn't have access to our traditional foods, uh, being very healthy and um, healthy people prior to that, the impact of European, pardon me, foods on, on our people was also devastating. Hence we have this, you know, disparate uh, life expectancy with mainstream still to this day where our um, our life expectancy is up to 20 years less than mainstream Australia. So we have stolen wages, stolen children, dispossession of lands and practices and the people there that you can, are looking at South Sea Islands where um, they were taken on ships and brought to Australia to be slave labour in the cane fields. So there's some pretty devastating and harsh stories in, in our history and our elders are calling for 
Australia to recognise those stories, to address them and to remember that it's now our shared story. It's not a them and us thing. It's our shared story. I don't know if many of you have um, seen this map. This is a map of the language groups and tribes and um, not all the dialects because Gundi Chamara is our nation, but we have six or seven dialects, um, as was mentioned in the introduction. And um, the languages here are primarily from here. They have no connection to other language families, such as English and French and Sanskrit are all derived from the same language family it, when you do the anthropology of it all. This is our Victorian Aboriginal Corporation Languages map, just giving you an indication of um, the 44 plus or more, over 50 languages and dialects. And this is my country down here in the southwest of Victoria. Okay, well, that's probably a lot to <laughs> take in and think about. And um, so the, the, the impacts that we're still um, experiencing in this day is embedded within the systems that we live in. The racism is um, often, then bias is often unrecognised. And um, so we, de we deal with that when we're dealing with institutions or, you know, agencies and, and just people in general. Um, it's very much embedded in the Australian psyche and it takes a long time, as people would know, and education is one of the tools that um, we use to hopefully change uh, people's thinking. So my work is founded in Aboriginal ways of knowing, being and doing, which is a about Aboriginal standpoint, I suppose, and also about how we think, live and be. So it's informed from our cultural law. And there's been many other, um, Ali Morton Robinson, Lester Rigney, um, a whole heap of people who have, um, Martin Nakata from um, Torres Strait, who write about Aboriginal standpoint and Aboriginal ways of knowing and pedagogies and methodologies and so I call mine um, Aboriginal Ways of Knowing, Being and Doing and in my language I say uh, Wangan Nutjung for respect and Chama Teach is uh, knowledge. So respect is a big foundational principle and value in describing Aboriginal culture. Respect and relationship are probably the two key words in in a big story to make it short. Um, it's about proper behaviour, practice of protocols and relationship is our interconnectedness, kinship and belonging. So fundamentally our cultures have a foundational thing of belonging and interconnectedness that's based on that everything is connected. Every tree, every animal, um, insect, bird, water, is a living entity and we are in relationship with it. So our languages reflect this in the way we talk about um, relationships, kinship, and um, we have totemic systems and things like that that ensure that every being has a place and a belonging. So no one is left out or left behind. Our protocols are negotiated. Um, like I said, one of the protocols for being welcomed into countries, you know, if I come, I have to sit and wait until you call me in and invite me in and then give me permission to speak. And that, that's um, a pretty foundational practice in how we like to relate and do our business. It's not always understood by um, some of our institutions, though. Uh, methodology, so... How I do, how I be is about story, story of place, listening to stories, reflecting, particularly when I'm working in communities that aren't my own, but of course in my own community, but in communities where it's not my place or my country. So, for example, I can't bring a Gundich Mara story. And again, in my introduction, um, Ajanta talked about the acknowledgement to the Kulin people that on whose lands that Rosales and I both work here in Melbourne, Australia, which I 
probably forgot to mention at the start, we acknowledge um, those countries, but I can't bring a Gunditch Mara story and put it in place here because um, it's about that relationship. So it's a um, very important thing. And collaboration is kind of inherent in my practice um, because it's an inherent collaboration and reciprocity inherent in our, again, our being and our doing. So current practice and themes, um, story of place, people and community, living legacy. So this is part of my message for hope, um, which I hope comes through in the work that I'm descri- I'll be describing. Um, I have got quite a few slides, so I'm going to start flicking through a few. Um, I do a whole lot of mixed media, multimedia, uh, a bit of everything and anything. Um, if I'm, you know, I've been invited and worked in glass, which I've never done before, so that was a great experience. I do work in possum skin cloaks, which I'll talk more about soon. Painting, and it's in this the symbols and the the paintings and the designs I'm going to talk about um, and look at some of the different iconography from across Australia and what informs our works today and um, where those sources of inspiration come from. And because we're an oral language and um, when I get to talking about our language work about how we're thinking, how can we, besides using English, how else can we look at uh, writing our language because we didn't have script of course. I do a lot of public art as well which I'm very fortunate so I work across a lot of different like I said mediums and materials and this is kind of showing I like to work with materials that are from the earth preferably so stones and um, minerals that come from the earth like steel and cast iron and timber. Uh, weaving uh, I do weaving our traditional weaving this is my auntie my dad's older sister who Um, carried forward our our weaving tradition in our family and passed it on to a daughter. And um, I learnt off another auntie, a different one. Public art installation, again about weaving and family and storytelling and having a cup of tea around the kitchen table where a lot of our knowledge transmission still occurs, where we're sitting down with our families talking and telling stories. So my cousin Bronwyn's Nan and Pop, our Nan and Pop are sitting there woven ones, having a cup of tea, looking at photos or telling stories. And I involve my, involve my family. So my sister-in-law, my sister, nieces and all cousins created works to go in the teapot. Some imagery of paintings and works that I've done to kind of give an idea of visual different um, kind of symbols and motifs that I use and that probably representative of some of the Victorian Aboriginal style of Uh, imagery. I use text sometimes in works. These are prints that I do. I've been fortunate to do printmaking as well and they're all story. This is the Mount Emu Creek on our country and the names of the places along the creek. Possum cloaks, the story of the Magellan clouds in the sky with the two brogas and this is the seven sisters, the Pleiades, Korokia, Um, which I'm sure uh, many people might be aware of stories from their own communities because the Seven Sisters is such a a song line, a storyline that goes around the world. Uh, Some public artwork, um, a major installation in Melbourne City I did with um, Trina Hamm and Lee Darrick and all of the communities across Victoria. Some more, a campfire. You see in the middle picture here we've um, done some collaborating with uh, different uh, diaspora communities in from India and this is my eldest daughter and Nithya um, who've been dancing around the campfire perf- doing a performance. Oh, and this one, I left this in accidentally, it's not really meant to be there, with some of my notes. <laughs> uh, so some of the different kinds of iconography and symbols and motifs from around Australia. These are uh, rock engravings from New South Wales and this is from um, up at Gary Word, uh, a very special place for a number of our tribes, including ours, where we meet uh, for gatherings and exchange in a spiritual place. Um, Billamina Rock Shelter, uh, again in, at Gary Word, and this is Bu- uh, Bunjil's Cave. And Bunjil is the um, kind of senior creator of our, our knowledge and culture, and his two dogs there. <laughs> 
Um, this is some rock art from over in the Kimberley. Um, some pretty amazing um, Guion uh, rock art from the Kimberley again. The running figures from the NT and the Wanjinas. So there's a lot of um, amazing rock art in Australia. Uh, body painting symbols and motifs. We see, and again in the top left hand corner, our second daughter Yaren, who's there and there, dancing again with Priya and Nithya. And um, I was singing with um, Uttara on the stage for a collaborative performance. So if you look at the markings, the paintings on the bodies, this is what informs and inspires. Here we are with paint ups and people dancing. Again, the men, here's some older photos of ceremonies um, with body paint ups. And this is um, an image of a message stick that I drew from a description in a historical record um, of a message stick that one of our ancestors sent out to gather the tribes prior to the invasion. They'd heard about the white men and the sickness. The smallpox had been through our country and other countries and it, this was a meeting to prepare what were we going to do about the Europeans. And this I used for the uh, 2006 Commonwealth Games. But um, what I'm referencing here is the markings that were put on the, um, pardon me, message stick. And these markings here where the little icons going up and down um, were the body paint ups for the messengers. And so the messengers would have body paint ups and markings that would indicate to the tribe that he was going to send the message to what the nature of the message was and he would also have marks that help him count how many days and and how long and how to record the information on his body for what the message was also the marks on the objects such as shields and spears and things are other things that inform our visual communication and our communication systems which uh, why i'm kind of showing all these different kinds of motifs in that is that you know, we have a story which, when I say a story, it's a story with a capital S. Um, it's a proper noun. It's a story that's not a fairy tale. It's not a legend or a myth. Um, they're teaching stories. They're law stories. And they're, they're about how to live and be in country and who and how you're related. And um, a story has a song. It has a dance. It has a paint up and um, perhaps markings either in caves and rocks and bark paintings and possum skin cloaks, which I better hurry up and get to. So this is um, a painting of William Barrack, a uh, Wurundjeri from the Kulin Nation elder who took up painting. You can see the markings and the women sitting, drumming and um, with their possum cloaks on. Other markings that inform things are things like this um, Dendroglyph from the Wiradjuri country carved into a scar in the tree and the scarred trees where we take wood for um, canoes and other things. People might be familiar, very familiar or more familiar <clears throat> with the dot art from the desert and um, a lot of the symbols that people see have been uh, made widely known from this, the dot art. And the dot art comes from the desert people and comes um often from their uh, sand drawings for ceremony and storytelling, and they've translated that into acrylic paintings. So a lot of you'll see a lot of these um, motifs and symbols in contemporary artworks. Uh, some Victorian Aboriginal artists whose um, motifs are informed by our style of work, which is not dots as such, but a lot of line work and um, diamond chevrons and um, things like that. Marie Clark on the left, Mandy Nicholson. Bark paintings, uh, people would be possibly aware of the bark paintings from the Top End Mob. That's kind of their thing up there and their style. This is a possum skin cloak and it's the Lake Condor possum skin cloak, which is from my grandmother's country and it's held in the Melbourne Museum. And um, it's from the makers of this cloak, one of whom was my great great grandfather, that the inspiration and the current contemporary revitalization of cultural knowledge and practices with the possum cloaks has come to live back in communities and this is um the old one that 
uh, my great great grandfather was one of the makers with six other men and this is a line drawing of a black and white line drawing of the, the designs which are uh, incised into the the raw skins uh, with a muscle shell or um, sharpened stone implement and this is what um, they are and we're, we're still in process of decoding um, what some of these symbols mean but mostly they're representing country and people and ceremonies and families and most possum cloaks will have a maker's mark so this is another older one that's held in a museum overseas um, I think this is in the Smithsonian in Washington the Hunter Valley people belong to this cloak in New South Wales this is a Tungarong cloak so you can see the contemporary use of Victorian type symbols and motifs probably not very good to photo sorry about that but these are some more of the cloaks from the Melbourne 2006 Commonwealth Games which was the major catalyst for the reinvigoration of possum cloak making and some people in the cloaks uh, a favorite person of mine and a good dear friend Esther Kirby in her cloak she made and some historical photos and this is uh, another cloak you can see similar kind of iconography on there and cloaks living back in communities today in ceremony um, this one is particularly around my work in looking at mourning and mourning practices because we we're wrapped um, in our cloaks and buried in them and young people so this is part of the the hope in into the future of the young people coming through who are learning this little girl's making a possum armband for herself to take home we have generations in workshops uh, working together making cloaks learning from each other again um, learning stories learning language this is a song we wrote at this workshop here which is in my community on making a possum cloak and so um, I was able to teach people some language through um, writing that song and possum cloaks like I said earlier in the barrack paintings were drummed on so people we've got children here drumming while the other ones are dancing and Saban there oh okay so we're back to language now that so that's my work very quickly in possum cloaks and talking about the different types of visual communication across Australia and um, I thought I'd talk a bit about our language work at Vackel who is the peak body for representing all of these um, language groups in advocacy and representing to the state advocating for support and resourcing and also our core business is to support each of those language groups in their work for revitalization so because of the impacts like I said people were forbidden people were removed uh, survivors kept knowledge and practices hidden and um, but we are working mainly from a few remnant phrases and words spoken in our language and historical records there are some speakers from a couple of the languages up in the mountains and across the borders here probably three language groups who have people who are somewhat close to fluent and the rest of us are learning again uh, my dad as i said um, started our language revitalization work back in 1996 with the well 92 but it was 96 when he published um, our dictionary and this is his quote um, and that's him wrapped in his cloak <laughs> uh, that's the dictionary and this is um, some of the family at a language camp and some of the work I'm trying to do currently with getting beyond words so a lot of people use words and we might use an English sentence and replace a word as well as like in addition to what we call term Aboriginal English where we already are talking in language ways and sometimes using language words but people once learning language start adding words into their um, daily use uh, but it's actually speaking fluently how do we get to uh, speaking fluently so I'm um, building on the grammar that's been um, done or recorded and um, what linguists have had a look at previously so I'm building grammar and part of this is like getting people to learn language around activities for us as a starting point to uh, developing a language community to build a language ecology so we have all the, the little language communities in within families that we can then start 
sharing and um, building towards fluency. So a uh, long way to go, though. So um, living legacy is is the key word. So when I was invited and I seen the hope, I'm thinking, what is the hope? And my hope, whilst um, having worked like my father and my grandfather before me in our community, fighting for our rights, working in education or health or the like to um, make things better for our younger generations and those yet to come, you do a lot of work and sometimes it feels like you're getting nowhere. And in this current age, we have such a lot in um, recording things and digitising things and sometimes we're so busy doing the digitising and taking photos and recording that we're we're forgetting to sit down and tell the story around the fire or around the kitchen or however it is that works. And so I'm making a really conscious effort to, in the work that I'm doing and about to do, I'm just going to start a three-year project next year, supporting language revitalization and fluency through immersion and is to be able to, you know, privilege our ways of doing um, notwithstanding we absolutely have to record everything and digitize everything but we have to privilege our oral traditions otherwise they're going to be taken over and they're going to be lost and and it's that um, for me the uh, what's that word uh, you know like a steamroll it's relentless and it implacable um, pressure of the colony and the colonial state of being that can you know just continuously drives and oppresses and you have to continually resist and and remember otherwise you suddenly turn around and you don't have your language anymore so living legacy in there's a couple of my grandkids here and daughters and nieces and nephews at a ceremony at the campfire this is at the old people's home and this is a community ceremony where we were doing a naming ceremony for all the babies and this is my little grandson, he's 13 now, but he's very cute there. And living legacy in sharing our learnings, what we know, and keeping those practices strong and alive through the sharing. So this is um, Yaren doing a smoking ceremony, the girls dancing at a an a, a exhibition opening event and at a festival event dancing, Black Swan Dance that one was, very beautiful. And again, Yaren teaching this, three of the grandsons up there with her, her son and Finlow and Ethan, Keanu, teaching some song and dance at the Melbourne Museum. And in our family, um, ensuring that we, we keep and teach the children. And like all the grandchildren now, um, I just used to possum skin cloaks, but when I was growing up, we didn't have them. And my children didn't grow up around them until oh, about... 21 years ago so a couple of them were still at home but the others had left and um, so now these grandchildren just um, you know are used to it it's the norm for them and so we're here at um, up in their grandfather's country Rob uh, my partner um, doing a birthing tree ceremony so um, we had a few babies and we'd save their placentas till we could go and bury them on the special sacred mother mountain, Gulaga, in uh, Yuan country. So here we are having a family ceremony. Now this photo is one that I love, and Mick Harding from the Tungarong people took this. It's all the elders and community representatives from the Melbourne 2006 Commonwealth Games opening ceremony. It's the first time in uh, over 180 years that um, Aboriginal people in possum cloaks have gathered in that number to uh, perform a ceremony and it was uh, very historical and amazing and there's my dad up the back with his white hair <laughs> so probably to end um, I'll just check my notes I think that I've said most of what I wanted to talk about I think I hope I have these are um, values or um, behaviors and and messages I suppose I try to share um, in our language and um, behave properly 
Matui matui kio, have kindness and compassion. Matui matui, to be kind. Pang ma nutapana wing, no one left behind. And numbapi, forgiveness. Um, and the word of the day, manakuya, hope. And I hope that, um, well, oh, one of the things I suppose that I'm hoping before I sign off is for our Gunditjma languages is to, so why um, I was really interested when you invited me to come because uh, one of the things on our to-do list for our language is to write our own alphabet. And one of the tasks that I've um, given to one of my daughters is to dream our alphabet because uh, my colleague and friend Travis, who I work with, who's a, a university trained linguist, she worked, they worked with the Hmong people who dreamed their alphabet. And I'm like, well, that's what we need to do for the, our Gunditjmara languages. And so that is my hope and uh, something that I think uh, would be of interest to um, all of us here today celebrating Typography Day in what are those symbols, what are those words or letters or motifs that we might dream up for Gunditjmara language because at the moment we um, are using English letters and English, um, well, English letters to represent Aboriginal sounds and Aboriginal sounds are very different. Many of them are very different from standard English. So uh, Manakuya, that is my hope. And thank you, everybody, for listening and for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky, for that marvellous presentation. In some sense... An epiphany because in today's world, far removed from uh, an understanding of all this, uh, where the young, we under, underestimate the young, but I'm, I, I think they're very keen to know about these things. Uh, and it is our Manakuya that in the next 10 years of the global decade of indigenous languages, as presented by UNESCO, that we take this forward and your presentation today and Professor Mohanty's presentation yesterday are just the starting point of a very large, uh, almost uh, unimagined, you know, uh, landscape of work that needs to be done. And in our own humble way, typography will seek to do this also because uh, typography has a distinct advantage uh, in its make, which is that we move from place to place every year. And uh, that means that the language of the place gives you a context of the place and allows people, folks, experts from those places to come in and have their say. And in the past, we've been to Sri Lanka. Last year, we went to Jordan. We have just been inside India and trying to cover India itself is a project. Yeah. Right. And so that, that next year, we're going to be in the sacred city of Varanasi and we would like you to come. So the idea of Manakuya to take this forward and to take you and Professor Mohanty and uh, Ganesh Devi, another very eminent um, scholar in this uh, field, all of you uh, as our mentors is what we look forward to. Uh, I've invited Professor Monti to attend uh, your talk, which he is. And Professor Monti, if I may uh, request you to put in your first observation question, whatever you may want to, to uh, uh, Dr. Vicky Cousins. And then we will present the very, very nice comments that have come from the audience. Yes, thank you. Right. It's beautiful. Yeah. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. I was just going to say thank you for mentioning... Um, the decade I forgot, I shouldn't have forgot because it's very uh, much in my mind. The decade of Indigenous languages, absolutely. This is something that I'm very feeling very passionate that we have to get really moving and, um, you know, getting people to understand and recognize because the loss of language, I don't like to say loss, but the loss of language is so rapid um, around the world, you know, um, it's, it's just. Um, a really it's a crisis so, thank you you know most of you know the languages in uh, australia in the united states of america have been uh, lost in the last 200 300 years mm -hmm. but we have been lucky in a sense because in our uh, you know four varna system 
the Adivasis were never included. So the Adivasis were mainly excluded from the four Varna system. They became a part of the main so, uh, land, you know, much later. Yeah. And to be specific, after the British arrived, and you know, they wanted uh, to uh, not only British, other Christian missionaries when they arrived. You know, they wanted to preach Christianity, and that's how they went in, you know, to the jungles, to the hills, yeah. and the whole thing started. Then dictionaries, grammars were written, and all these things happened. Yeah. So that way, India has been. Uh, we have maintained, you know, thousands of languages for millennia. That way, we have been a little probably lucky. So yes. one interesting similarity I found between whatever you said and uh, said and whatever we have, you know, we also have those paintings on the walls and on the floor, uh, mm. on you know certain occasions in certain months of the year. And that indicates, you know, what kind of season we have. What kind? Of, I, I, I'm sure you know that we have, God knows, uncountable gods and goddesses. <laughs> so you know, uh, so you know, we have specialists on like uh, you know the Western world. We have specialists. Somebody looks uh, after something in the society. Yes. So you know that kind of. So and when we worship a god or a goddess, mostly goddesses, again, you will be surprised to know. That you know, uh, we have um, different kinds of painting, dif uh, painting of different colors. Yeah. So this is a you know, I find this kind of similarity, and uh, we do it not only you know the Aboriginals, who we call tribals in this country. We also do it. Hey, the so-called civilized. I of course call myself a tribal, because you know I'm an amalgamation of at least three streams: Indo-Aryan, Dravidian, and Munda. These are the things I find in my language or I can say languages and cultures, so that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So thank yeah. you very much. So I would like to see, you know, what our tribals do, which I have never seen, well, because they also paint their walls and other things. I would like to see, because you said that, you know, um, when they paint, it sends a message and there is a time till when they should preserve and all those things. That I have never investigated. So thank you very much for giving me that idea, I'll probably start doing that now. Thank you, um, Dr. Thank Ajanta you. Sen, for your opportunity. Thank you very, very much. It was a pleasure listening to you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mohati, uh, for your insights. And uh, I expect that Vicky and Professor Mohati, you, you know, we'll all start working together. We'll, we'll figure a framework. Uh, and before I come to come to the logistics of it there are a lot of beautiful comments for you vicky that i may want to you know read out to you nanki nath who's also our uh, a student a phd student she had done a phd uh, under professor pubaya at the idc and currently faculty uh, at another university she says thank you professor cousins for a session to remember, love the details of the symbolism from the Aboriginal cultures. Regards. Uh, we have from Gargi Mukherjee a very young, uh, very uh, vibrant uh, participant. I, mean, I, I was surprised to see how young she was because she had asked a lot of questions yesterday. Across the day, uh, she says, Gargi Mukherjee says, we have often seen, like in English, different nouns and pronouns being used to denote different genders in a language. Would you agree that a language hence gives a huge insight on how a culture that made that language views gender roles and at large their outlook towards life? So there, there's a question for you, Vicky. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, we have... Um, quite extensive kinship terms and pronoun systems. Um, some, I can't speak for all, but uh, some a bit more complicated than ours. Um, but yes, absolutely. The um, And we also have, um, well, the, it's not in practice in our community, but in some communities, avoidance languages, things like brother-in-law and mother-in-law tongue and men's language and women's language. So there's very much... Like I, you can still go to some Aboriginal communities where because of the nature of the relationship, people are not allowed to be in the same room or the same car. So you have to take separate cars for traveling and things like that. So it's very much embedded in, in the language in, because of that relationship 
um, those relationship kind of structures. So, ma'am, uh, would you agree that um, maybe language also plays a huge role in gapping the in bring in closing in the gaps between the gender roles? Um, how do you mean closing the gaps? I mean, uh, if we uh, have like when we talk about women or when we talk about men traditionally, they come with a lot of stereotypes. Like men are supposed to be a certain image, and women are certain uh, supposed to be a certain women image. So uh, a lot of countries in the world are still battling with that sort of what those stereotypes bring in and how they affect daily lives, right? So would you agree that language also plays a role in being able to close in those gaps between the two genders? Yes, absolutely. Um, because some of our languages have ge uh, gender terms that aren't just binary, so they're already um, that's embedded there. Um, like some of the North American ones, I don't know about. Um, probably Rosales would know um, about in Mexico, but I know in um, the states and Canada they do um, have languages, and so do we here for those other genders um, that um, I've been learning a lot more about in the last few years because um, mainly grew up with the, you know, he, she stuff. <laughs> and um, we know that the world is made up a lot of, of a lot more different people. A lot more grey, yes, right, yeah. exactly. Definitely. Uh, Thank you. Vicky, Thank there's you. a question from a faculty member from Industrial Design Centre, Venkatesh. Uh, Venkatesh yeah. says, the story with a capital S you talk is being not mythical, but entirely factual and informational to encode and transmit knowledge is extremely interesting. The artifacts such as cloaks, weapons, carvings, paintings, etc., performances such as ceremonies, dancing, singing, music, etc., are about carrying the story. In most cultures, the artistic and evocative experience usually precede meaning. Do you think this perhaps makes the script for the language unnecessary? Um, well, yes, it, it um, obviously did for a long time. Obviously, we're looking at script now, but um, I think so because... Uh, not only, which I didn't even, I forgot, that was, was one of the things I forgot to talk about, was sign language and body language. There was, there's a lot of um, different sign language that accompanies even just speaking, let alone if you're doing an activity and people can have conversa whole conversations without opening their mouths. So I think that that expression and the, um, like the question before around what does language um, give you about it's a complete insight into the a world view and a, a cultural lens and um, in in that being I think that that you know different ways of communication and or even mind to mind communication where we um, are using our intuition or our extrasensory senses is very much and then I oh, didn't even talk about like frequencies and um with sound you know and that form of communication because words express so much but um we pick up so much more in communication from whether it's the song or the dance and they're all the components of that story and that message but you pick up so much more than just what words are actually saying from our other senses you know, um, so yeah, um, yes, I, I, I think pretty much for uh, since time immemorial, at least 60,000 years, we didn't bother to write anything down, so to speak. <laughs> um, and sometimes that's probably a good thing, even now. Uh, look at the paper trails where we, where, uh, we have to follow for the bureaucracies, drives us all crazy. Um. <laughs> Uh, Professor Mohanty, you had a comment to make. Please go ahead. You know, just wanted to say that, you know, our tribals have a different concept of gender. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I will, uh, I'll give an example uh, for uh, Dr. Sen and Gargi uh, here because, you know, both from Odia and Bangla, you know, we make a distinction between human and non-human gender, not masculine and feminine. That's why, uh, you know, you will see that in, that's what, yeah, you, you will see that in Bangla, 
for the animals we always use a sex indicating word to say that whether it is male or female right Right. And uh, you know, um, in Odia, Vicky uh, Kuzinji, um, um, my mother tongue is Odia. You know, we have elevated two animals to the level of human beings. So, Bagha, a tiger, is our mother's brother. Yep. So, you know, uh, Bagha, we have Baguni. A she tiger is called Baguni. Yes. And Naga, the cobra, is a god. And you see, uh, Naga has Naguni. But I cannot use the, uh, do, uh, do the same thing to Hathi, Ghoda, uh, Kutta, whatever it is. You know, I'm using Hindi, uh, a dog, uh, you know, elephant, horse. I cannot do the same thing. I cannot derive a feminine form for these animals. Only for tiger and cobra. Because they are promoted to the level of human beings. So this is something, this is a very entire kind of discourse, which probably someday we'll do. It's a very fascinating thing, how different, you know, communities in India itself look at the concept of gender in different ways. So that will be very fascinating. So just wanted to say that. Nothing. Thank you very much. It is fascinating because we, we have male and female for uh, gender, you know, for animals. But one of the things I'm doing is working on, because like I said, we've got very few speakers and um, or no speakers, flu fluent speakers, and we're working off historical records and a couple of old recordings and what, what we grew up with some words. Um, so I'm doing grammar rebuilding so that we can talk properly and not just words. And part of that is the uh, looking at the different, um, animacy hierarchy and looking at understanding so that I'm doing the rebuilding from a cultural lens and not just, you know, from an English like relaxifying things. And so that, w w what is the, um, like you say, the tiger is at the same level as the human, so it gets treated in language the same, whereas, you know, other things don't necessarily so that's a really um it's really fascinating actually <laughs> trying to work all that out right um vicky uh, only for that little thing called lack of time we will need to uh, end session. Yeah. Uh, however in uh, in many parts of india and i do know it is there it is true of bengal where when you leave home and you're telling your mother I'm going. She says, never say I'm going. Always say I'm coming. And so that's what we're going to say to you, that yes. you will come as we leave the session, where in the spectrum of uh, the temporal spectrum of uh, time and moments, it's, it's temporary. It's just one part of the whole, uh, you know, interaction that we have commenced. And like you said, our manakuya is that we take it forward and do a full session uh, next year at Typography Day. And between Banaras and now, we discuss and put it forward so that we add dimensions to Typography Day through our competition, yeah. poster competition, etc., with a special section on uh, skip, so called scriptless language. And it's very interestingly, yesterday, our Afri speaker from Africa, he did the opposite of what mainstream does. What he did was to build type out of images. Mm -hmm. What we do is we build images out of type. And therefore, there's al already a convergence. We can see Vicky, Professor Monti, Vicky, we expect to bring in Professor Devi, who had addressed Typo Day in 2014. It was absolutely fascinating to people. We will say Abar Ashbo, which is we will come again. And on that note, we uh, say goodbye to you only for the moment, Vicky. Thank you so much for taking the trouble. I know. We hadn't given you a lot of time, but uh, we hope to do things in the next 10 years. And so therefore, in that uh, spectrum, spectrum of time, this is just a dot. Thank you, Dr. Vicky Cousins. On behalf of Typo Day, we will meet again. Over to you, Shweta. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. On behalf of Typo Day, we sincerely thank Dr. Ajanta Sen for chairing this session and to Dr. Vicky Cousins for her presentation. Thank you very much. We would also like to thank all the participants.